Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. The word of the Lord. So I need my drink this morning, my teas, in case I start coughing as I'm recovering from my cold, which I will say did put a damper on some 4th of July celebrations. But I hope that you had a wonderful 4th of July. I know that there were some wonderful things that happened around here. The Discover Zone had some great kiddo celebrations on Wednesday. Some people had time off with family and friends to enjoy cookout or vacations. Some of us are commiserating over barking and anxious dogs because of fireworks. Some of us had used the time to get a, fu- a few things done around here when the campus was less busy, so a big shout out to Jeff Moreland. And some got to celebrate a wonderful day of the annual Fresh Start Shower Ministry 4th of July cookout. We had around 100 guests, which included church members, shower guests, community members, and we invited the recovery group that meets here on, at noon to join as well. There were over 20 volunteers who braved the rain to make this a wonderful expression of gathering possible. And so we give thanks for all of you who helped make it. I hope that your day was filled with good things as you marked the birth of our country. And while we just passed one holiday, guess what? We get to look forward to another one soon. Any guesses? Easter. No. What else? (laughs) I'll give you a hint. It's coming up on July 16th and 17th. Prime Day. Amazon Prime Day, right? Aren't you excited? Well, I'll tell you, our spending tells us that lots of people around the world are excited. Last year in... What? (laughs) Yeah, for you. Last year in 2023, there was a record 12.9 billion, with a B, spent those on that two-day shopping event. And that doesn't count all of the other copycat shopping events, from Target Circle Week to Walmart's Mega Summer Sale to all the other places that are competing. And after all, it was a great idea to make up a holiday in the third quarter to increase your third quarter earnings to get looking great as you head into the fourth quarter holiday shopping. After all, Black Friday is not just a day anymore, remember? It's a state of mind. Or at least the month of November. After all, consumer spending is the engine that runs the American economy. And yet, and yet, Last week, Pastor Susan kicked off our sermon series, Enough, about discovering joy through simplicity and generosity, where we are exploring our personal finances through a spiritual lens. And during these four weeks, we are taking a spiritual look and also taking some practical tools that are helping us consider what our faith has to do with our finance. And if we do that, we can help, they can help us discover that we are free to live the life Jesus said he came to give, a life of abundance through simplicity, contentment, and generosity. So as we explore the, wis- uh, the topic of wisdom and finances today, I want to first say that there are three assumptions that are underneath Uh, during preaching this sermon series that I have, and I want them to share them with you because we won't be going too much into depth on them. First thing we all want to acknowledge, 
judgment-free zone, as we said last week. After all, talking about money can be very uncomfortable, as John already said. And I want to say, not one, not a single one of us, from your pastors to your elders to those who seemingly have it made to those who are barely scraping by, do not wrestle with let, or do not have to wrestle, or we all have to wrestle with letting our faithfulness shine through our finances. We are all on a spiritual journey. We are not here to judge past decisions or future ones. We are here to support each other as we form faith every day. Assumption one. Assumption two, there are a lot of external and economic factors and things that have gone into your personal financial situation. Some of them are really big things like racism, sexism, ableism, family wealth, and so many more. And some of those are outside of your control and mine. So as we are looking at our personal finances, we are not going to be talking about those factors too much. But when you are looking at your own, acknowledge where some of those impacts might have been felt. And also know that you do have some choices that you can make and some control. Third assumption. We believe that everything we have belongs to God. It's not really ours anyway. So as we center ourselves, acknowledging our discomfort with this topic, we are going to have a brief video reflection on last week's sermon to kind of catch those up who might have not been missed it or to remind some of those of what Pastor Susan preached about. And then I'll offer a brief prayer before we begin. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, be with us now in our comfort and our discomfort. And help us be grateful for what we have and know that much of what we want we do not need. And help us find joy in contentment, simplicity, and generosity. And as we open ourselves to you today, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our creator. Amen. One of my all-time favorite Shelverstein poems that I have shared before, actually, I think is a really great piece of financial wisdom. It's called Smart, and it goes like this. My dad gave me one dollar bill, because I'm his smartest son, and I swapped it for two shiny quarters, because two is more than one. And then I took the two quarters and traded them to Lou for three dimes. I guess he didn't know that three is more than two. And just then along came old blind Bates, and just because he can't see, he gave me four nickels for my three dimes, and four is more than three. And then I took the nickels to Hiram Coombs down at the seed feed store, and that fool gave me five pennies for them, and five is more than four. And then I went and showed my dad, and he got red in the cheeks, and closed his eyes and shook his head, too proud of me to speak. 
have always loved this poem of being smart compared to what many people would say are foolish choices. And I think we like it because we all get to feel su superior, right? Because we would never be so foolish in our finances after all. The poem also reminds us of our scripture lesson today, which is called The Parable of the Prodigal Son. And for those of you who are familiar with this, you might have found the reading odd because it just stopped before the end of the story. And if you're like me, perhaps you felt a little discomfort because where was the happy ending? Where was the resolution of the prodigal son who was welcomed home and back with a huge, lavish party? Where's the son, other son, who goes and kind of pouts a little bit? What does it mean when we're stuck in the middle? Most of the time when we talk about this parable, we talk about as a lost and found parable. We talk about the parable of the lost sheep or the lost coin, and sometimes this is called the lost son. And so when we call it the prodigal son, we often think that it means being lost. But prodigal does not mean someone who wanders away or is lost. It means someone who wastes money, someone who is wasteful. A prodigal wastes money, like a spendthrift or a squanderer, or maybe we would think of a shopaholic. And if we combine this idea of the prodigal as someone who wastes money with the idea of kind of stopping in the middle, we perhaps see a new dimension to our story. And perhaps if you are like me, you can begin to relate a little more to the prodigal. Because most of the time, I'll be honest, when I've read the parable, I kind of identify with the, loss, with the son who stayed and worked really hard and maybe gets a little grumpy about it and has to learn that lesson. After all, I haven't made really bad choices in my life. I didn't, I still talk to my mom, we're good. But maybe you have felt that way. But once we begin to think of the prodigal as the one who wastes money, Perhaps a few more of us can identify with this character and we can begin to learn from it. Perhaps some of us understand how deeply the prodigal son feels when he says he longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. The truth is many of us, all of us I would say, struggle with the habit of wasting money. Tomorrow isn't on our radar. We want what we want when we want it, and we want it today, or at least in that 24-hour prime delivery window. I know I do. After all, who doesn't love a sale? Or getting that one thing that will make us more productive, more efficient, make our life easier, make us better or prettier at home, make our house nicer, our car better, or just make everything easier. The problem with that kind of thinking is that for most of us, the famine eventually comes. It comes when we have a long series of unfortunate events where perhaps you've had two cars totaled in five years when both of them have been paid off. Or when tragedy strikes with medical illness or fires or natural disasters. It comes when the air conditioner unexpectedly breaks in the middle of summer. It comes when we impulsively buy, buy, and buy. It comes when we are taken advantage of by our family or friends. It comes when we've spent everything we have and then even a little bit more of next year's income. And we grow deeper and deeper in debt. And then finally, like the prodigal, we are forced into this place where we find ourselves. And we have nothing left, not even credit, and we can't figure out how we are going to make it. And I will also share another truth. It seems that the more financially secure we become, the less we worry about spending money here 
and there. We waste a dollar on this or that, and we forget where it went. Money seems to flow through our fingers. Now, you may be asking, why should we concern ourselves with this in church? Why are we talking about our relationship with money and possessions? Well, it is because that relationship is a spiritual issue. Money is simply a tool. It isn't good or bad. In the Shel Silverstein poem, it was just a piece of paper. But our relationship with money and possessions is a reflection of our relationship with God. And here's the challenge. Every day we hear messages to consume more and more almost every single moment. But God reminds us we do not exist simply to consume as much as we get and to get as much pleasure as we can while we are here on this earth. As people of faith, as children of God, you and I have a different purpose than that. You and I were created to care for God's creation. We were created to love God and to love our neighbors and to love ourselves. We were created to care for our family and for those in need and for our community and the world. And Micah 6.8 reminds us that God expects us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And our money and possessions need to be devoted to helping us fulfill this calling. We need to know and understand that our purpose is the way that uh, is the important thing, and then we use our money in ways that are consistent with that purpose. That is one of the keys to abundant life that we talk about. Now here's the hard part. Being able to accomplish the greater purposes God has for our lives requires some work. It requires some measure of planning. It doesn't just happen magically. And becoming wise stewards of our God-given resources requires taking time to set goals related to our lives and our finances. Now you may be saying, well, where do we start? First, we have to know our why, our calling, why we are here, what is our purpose, and what goals we have in light of ourselves for that purpose. Now, this doesn't happen overnight, but start with a simple one, and you can begin that journey as you take a spiritual look at your finances, and then you can see how some short-term and medium-term and long-term financial planning goals can help you live more fully into that calling from God. And as you are doing this, we would like to share six key financial principles that we all can use to help us manage our money with wisdom and with faith. By examining these, they can help you develop and live into those financial goals which serve your higher purpose. These financial keys are nothing magical, but they are principles listed in your bulletin. So you don't need to worry about writing them down if you don't want to, you can just listen. Or if you're a writer, feel free to grab a pen or a pencil in the pew and make notes. So here we go, six. First principle is this, pay your tithe and your offering first. Put God first in your living and your giving. This is a spiritual principle that works. Sometimes we like to say God is first in our lives, but we don't get the full impact of what that means until that includes putting our money where our mouth is. Because when you put God first, you give your tithe and offering from the quote unquote top of your paycheck, you and I can learn to live on whatever remains with faith and joy. Now, I wanna add a little caveat by putting on your top of your paycheck, does that mean if your rent or your mortgage comes out on the first, you should give your tithe on the first so that you bounce your written mortgage check every day? No, it doesn't. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being disciplined. And when you get income, saying this is what I'm going to give to God first. Whether it comes out automatically reoccurring on the first, the 15th, or the 20th, personally, I don't think God really cares about that. But this idea of giving to God first from our income 
is a spiritual practice that will literally change your life and set you free. I'll say both your pastors know this, your elders know this, and so do many others in this congregation. And each of us have had our own journeys through this. We have developing this practice of tithing and giving proportionally over many, many years. Like I said, it doesn't happen magically. And while there's nothing magical about this 10% idea, I think we can say this. When you give to God first, at least that amount, you come to realize two very important things. First, that assumption. You come to experience that all that you have is from God and that you need God in your life to help you live responsibly. Secondly, when you develop this discipline, you begin to find that you can be disciplined in the rest of your finances. So no matter where you start, whether it's 1% or a tithe, 10%, 15, 20, proportional giving, if you've been given that much to be able to give, get into the practice of giving, of giving to God first and keep building on that until you experience freedom and abundant life. Principle number two, create a budget and track your expenses. Now, creating budget, that's a fancy word. We use it a lot. But really, it just means develop a plan in which you are telling your money what to do. Tracking your expenses with a budget is like trying to balance the scales. It allows you to see what you're doing, and it motivates you to be more careful to make sure that you're not spending more than you can afford. In the bulletin, you find a basic budget worksheet that you can take home and use as a tool for doing this. And if you're looking at that and go, "Mm, that doesn't apply to me, there are so many different ways that you can do this. Some people literally use an envelope system where they actually like put cash in envelopes, which I'll have to say as a person who doesn't carry cash finds that a very odd system to pay my bills. Um, I'm a huge fan of digital and automation, so I use an online app that called You Need a Budget, which syncs my accounts, um, and that both John and I can access, and that way we know where our money is and we can put it into different places. There are spreadsheets and there are resources all over the place. And there are also many folks who find it helpful to seek the advice of a financial advisor. And if you are in crisis and in that place of famine, and you know that the numbers just won't add up, there are financial counselors who can help you develop a workable plan. We also have people in our congregation who can help. All you have to do is ask. But whatever approach you choose, the important thing is simply to have a plan. Take that step of faith and begin to develop one. Is it going to be perfect? No. But Starting there is a good first step. Third principle, simplify your life. And this means not living above, but below your means. And because this discipline is such a critical part of our financial, of any success for a financial plan, we're going to talk about it all next week. So we'll move on to number four. Number four is establish an emergency fund. Now, what is an emergency fund? An emergency fund is a separate bucket of money that you hold on to that's set aside specifically for emergencies. Experts recommend beginning with $1,000 and trying to ultimately build that to at least three months worth of income. But how do you start if you don't have any money? Garage sale, get rid of some of that extra stuff perhaps that you have around. And then you can slowly begin to build that emergency fund so that when that emergency happens, you have a bucket of money you can use and you don't have to put things on credit. Number five, pay off your credit cards and try to use cash or debit cards for purchases and use credit wisely. As you are building that emergency fund, begin to pay off the credit card debt and start using those things cash for purchases. Some experts say start with a credit card that has the highest interest rate. Others suggest paying down the smallest debt first so you get to experience that and put that into the next one and it snowballs from there. However you want to do it, 
there's no right or wrong. Just continue to pay off that debt. And then cut up the cards or unlink them with your Apple or Google Pay. Don't save them in your computer or your phone so that you can really quickly click that button. And also be aware of that lovely button that now is there, the buy now, pay later in just four installments. Turn off your notifications from stores and unsubscribe from marketing texts and emails. These are all ways that we are encouraged to give into impulse buying. There's a reason those deals are lightning or flash. So don't let your future be compromised for today's pleasure as the prodigal son was. If you use a credit card, pay it off monthly. The most important thing is before you put something on credit, pause. Wait 24 hours before you make that purchase. Pray about whether or not it is a wise decision. We aren't living in supply chain shortages anymore right now. It will be there tomorrow. Number six, practice long-term savings and investing habits. Saving money is the number one wise money management principle that every single one of us, no matter our age or no matter our income, can practice. Whether it is a gift from a birthday or our first job or our retirement, we all can save. And here's this first thing. We don't save money simply to save money. There's what we call, we have a word for that, it's hoarding. And hoarding is kind of like keeping it for ourselves. But we save so that there is a purpose. And there are three types of savings that you should have. Emergency savings for when life happens because it does. Savings for wants and goals. I heard this once of somebody thinking about saving money means that future me gets to spend it. So it doesn't mean that you aren't going to get to spend it ever. It just means future you spends it. And then the final way is retirement, your long-term savings or legacy savings, which will give you the opportunity to lead a content, simple, and generous life well into the future. Six financial principles. And each one of these are pieces of wisdom that help us be wise with our finances. Because being prodigal, being wasteful, will, is not a path to allow us to achieve God's purpose and calling for our lives. And here's the thing. Even if we have been prodigal, even if we have made a financial mess of our lives, even if we are experiencing famine right now, this is the great and the good news. God is there. God offers us a way out. God is there asking us to come home with arms open wide. And God's dream of an abundant life for you can still be realized. As you begin to put God first, and as we all practice habits that will lead us to simplicity, contentment, and generosity so that we can experience the joy of a God-filled, abundant life. That's the smart thing. Amen? Amen.